Um, we are in Nehemiah chapter 8. If you go to Bibles, please open up there and follow through as we go through through Scripture and look at Nehemiah. Now, as you can remember from the exile return, there were three different returns. One return was uh, under Zerubbabel, and he came back to build the temple. He was there to establish temple worship again by building the temple so that God then had a place to inhabit. People knew that they could go back there and be in the temple with God. The second was the reform of the heart, and that was Ezra. He came back to teach the people about God, because a lot of them had forgotten about Him and gone their own way and done their own things and forgotten the gap about God and just pushed to one side. Then the third one, which is the book we've been reading now at the moment, the book of Nehemiah, is the third return. And that was to build the walls, to build the walls around Jerusalem so that there wouldn't be any more attacks on Jerusalem. And so we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, obviously, Nehemiah and Ezra were contemporaries. Nehemiah, uh, Ezra was a priest, and Nehemiah was a cupbearer who became the governor of Jerusalem. So here we have uh, Ezra teaching the exiles for 13 years. You talk about an education. Most times we go to school and we're there for 12 years, and then somebody goes out and they study, they go to uni and study a degree for an extra couple of years. Now I imagine that 13 years these people have been hearing from Ezra as they've returned back to the promised land. Ezra has been taking God's law, uh, mostly the first five books of the Bible, and been reading it to them and explaining it to them. Now you can imagine after an intense study of God's word for 13 years, imagine if pastors had to do 13 years before they could teach God's Word, how amazing would that be? We'd have a lot of really, really old pastors as well. But here, he's teaching them and preparing them for reform. And it's not a reform of, of external things, it's a reform of the heart. He's there to, to really reform the people, to understand what God really wants from them in their lives. It's not just about their actions. It's not just about morality. It's not just about principles. It's about the love of God being provided for them every day in each day. If we have a look at this uh, passage of uh, 18 verses, I want you to um, think of it in these three terms. From, from uh, verse 1 to verse 8, we've got the intellectual response of the word. The intellectual response of the word. Uh, number two, um, the emotional response to the word. That's verses 9 to 12. And then from 13 to 18, we've got the voluntary or the volitional response to the word. So yes, three responses to the word that I want to go through and then just elaborate on it today so that we can understand when God's word, word comes to us, there's a responsibility there. Firstly, intellectually, to understand. Secondly, an emotional that's got to touch our hearts. And thirdly, our actions. We've got to go out and do. It doesn't promote works. This does not promote works. It promotes responsibility. God has given us each one, under His word, responsibility that we need to fulfill so that His work can be done. Let's have a look at verses 1 to 8. Yeah, we've got the people gathered in the square. Imagine a massive square, lots of people gathered there, and they told Ezra, bring the law of the Lord. Yeah, it's not a case of Ezra going there and saying, hey guys, come, I want to teach you. They have heard so much for 13 years. Now they are there in, in the square, gathered, and they say, Ezra, go get the law, bring it to me. We want to hear more of the law. So they come Men, women, children, all who can understand. There's an intellect, intellectual engagement happening. They read from the law from morning till midday. Now what would you think if I preached from 6 o'clock until 12? <laughs> I don't think I'd have much of a congregation there, would I? Um, but this is exactly what they did. They took God's word and yet Ezra actually spoke to the people from God's Word. Spoke to the people about God's Word. Got an understanding of what God's Word was from early, from early in the morning until midday. 
That's a lot of teaching. They were attentive to the book of the law. As he read, they accepted these things. They took them in and they thought about it. There was a thought process that was going on to, under, to, to say, man, I understand what he's saying. Um, uh, I want to apply it to my psyche. It's got to seep into my head so that I can really turn it around and understand each word that is written in the law of Moses. Israel led by praising God for all that was in the word. But I don't think we do that enough. In taking God's word and saying, we must be so thankful for this word because it is God's salvation that has come to us that is going to change us internally so that people can see externally that something has happened. Say so praise is God. And what's the people's response? Amen, amen, for preaching for six hours. <laughs> That's a great response. That means they've accepted it, that it's made sense. And that something is going to happen. The next step is almost there. People lifted their hands and bowed low to show their reverence to God. So this, this knowledge that they took in had an effect on their heart and caused them to worship. The Levites helped the people to understand the law. So you've got this massive gathering of people and you've got these Levites. There were many of them dispersed amongst the people. And as Israel would say something, they would say, um, do you know what that means? Um, this means such and such and such about the law. And, and, and all of a sudden, the light goes on that one can hear more. And so uh, I would say this is the, the first, first um, account of expositional preaching. <laughs> Nehemiah had a platform built, purpose built to stand above the crowd, to read God's word, for us to have reverence for God's word. And the Levites have helped the people to understand the law. Levites were among them and gave sense to the people. And they understood the reading of the, of, of the law of the word. So here you've got people, as, as it were, if, imagine this is a big assembly. There will be people sitting amongst you, explaining. You say, well, what does that word mean? And the Levite would say, well, it means this. And this is the, 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 the change it's got to have in your life. So there was an explanation going on. So that's verses 1 to 8. Number two, we've got the emotional response. So now that the word has come through their brains and they understand it, what now? What's going to happen? There's got to be an emotional response. And I'm not talking about just a wet toilet paper emotional response. That's just no substance whatsoever. There's substance because it has penetrated the psyche. It's penetrated their heads. And now it's going to penetrate their hearts. From verses 9 to 12. Nehemiah, Ezra, and the Levites taught the people. They didn't just read the word. They actually taught the people. They declared, this day is holy to the Lord, your God. Do not mourn and weep. Why were the people mourning and weeping? Because they heard the word of God. It penetrated their minds. It penetrated their hearts. And they realized how sinful they were. They realized just what they needed to do. To be able to understand what God wanted for them. People wept as they heard the words of the Lord. Emotional response to what was happening deep within them. Levites comfort the people. Encourage them to go eat, drink and not to grieve. So yes, people cut to the heart. These people are destroyed because they heard the word and they knew that if they don't do something that God wants them to do now, they are doomed forever. It's almost as if another exile would happen. But this would be a permanent exile. And not just of land, but of heart. Their hearts would be damaged. And so, this word is said, the joy of the Lord was their strength. The priests and Levites and Asher said to them, you've got to remember that whatever God puts you through, He's going to take you through and He's going to give you strength. And that strength will be fulfilled in the joy that you will experience. How many of you experience, experience really hard times, maybe of recent or, 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 or uh, a long time ago, and you sense, man, how am I ever going to get through this? But then through it, God gives you an incredible joy in your heart that you know that regardless of what happens to you circumstantially, God has got this. And He's going to help you through it. Whether it be a financial issue, whether it be a family issue, whether it be praying for somebody, whether it be anything, God is going to help you through. And so uh, Ezra re re reminds the Israelites that the joy of the Lord is their strength. 
They can't find joy in their position. They can't find joy in money, in power, in status. But it's God's joy that gives strength. And that joy is given by God alone. People turn from grieving to rejoicing because they have understood the words that were declared to them. So yeah, it's an understanding, but a change of heart as well. Then verses 13 to 18, we've got the final change. So we've had the knowledge in the head, the change in the heart, now the change in what they're going to do. The volitional, the volitional response to the Lord. Heads of fathers' houses, um, houses of all people, priests, Levites, come together to Ezra to study the word. Do you understand that only by studying God's word can we really know his heart? If we don't study his word, we will not know how to be changed. It was the seventh month, and according to the Levites, the Israelites dwelled in booths. And this comes right back to the book of Leviticus, where they were going to enter into the promised land, and they um, dwelt in, in booths, and we get the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. They went out, they heard this, they went out, got branches, built booths, and for seven days they lived in these booths. From the days of Joshua, uh, son of Nun, to the return of the, of the exiles to Jerusalem, they had not kept that feast. That was uh, uh, roughly about 800 years they had not kept that feast. And so there was incredible joy that happened because they did this. There was great joy. For seven days, Ezra read God's word. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly. So yes, Ezra, taking God's word and giving it to the people for seven days while they tabernacled, while they lived in booths made by trees and leaves. And then on, this, on the eighth day, there was a massive assembly. And they praised God. This passage holds really important lessons about teaching and receiving the law by the community of faith. We are a community of faith here at Cornerstone. Each one of you are part of God's plan, not only for this church, but for the suburb that we live in. The suburb of Alex Hills needs your commitment to Christ to be shown in everyday life. It has to do with the right response to God's word so that worship can take place. And by worship, I don't just mean the singing of songs. We come to worship in the morning and that's uh, the, the, the person preaching. That's the person leading worship. That's the person praying. That's the person reading scripture. That is the worship of God. But it doesn't just stop there. It's when you walk out those doors and you go into today and tomorrow and next, and, and next week and the following week and your every moment of your day is worship to God. This is only a coming together of the people of faith. A small part of that. Spurgeon quoted, yeah, he says, Nothing teaches us about the preciousness of the Creator as much as when we learn the emptiness of everything else. Everything else is empty besides what God wants to do in your life. He can give it meaning. He can give it meaning. John Piper said, God created us for this. To live our lives in a way that makes Him look more like the greatness and the beauty and the infinite worth that He really is. This is what it means to be created in the image of God. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. If we are not satisfied in, 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 in God, we cannot glorify Him. There is no way. There's no connection. There's got to be a connection to those two things. So when we read scripture and digest it, it becomes part, not only of our intelligence, not only over here when we take it in, but it travels to our heart. And it remolds our whole life as Jesus would have it to. If we read scripture um, to purely have it as information, and that information doesn't have an impact on the way we live, we are on dangerous ground. We become like the Pharisees and the scribes. We become like the law uh, keepers who were just interested in the law, but that only was intellectual, it wasn't emotional. And there was no response. When we read God's word, three things need to happen. I want you to listen to these three things. First of all, there must be an intellectual response. An intellectual response when we take God's word and we read it. We must be cognitive about what we are reading. 
It's no use me reading in German and you don't understand German. What's, what, what's the good of that? There's got to be a context inside which we can actually framework everything we hear. The words have to make sense. And we've got to take them in and we've got to process them up here because this is the start of the whole process. Secondly, then there has to be an emotional response. First step has to do with the mind, the second has to do with the heart. By emotional response, I mean that it is God to move you. God's Spirit, being your conscience, has to impress on your heart what the next step is and what the truth is and what is being read. As you can see, it isn't the other way around. Having emotions stirred without truth does nothing in your life. If it's just an emotional response, then we just like everybody else on TV who, who, who just jeer up the crowd and once that's done and the emotion is gone, what is left? Absolutely nothing. Truth stirs the heart into action. Once the head understands, the heart follows. Being cut to the heart, as the men were in uh, the, the, the first chapter of Acts. They were absolutely cut to the heart. And then we get to step three. Important step. We have a, a voluntary response. In Acts, Peter preached. He preached God's word. He had a, a mass of people in front of him. And he said, this is what happened. And they were convicted and asked, what do we do now? So once it's coming to our heads and it's pierced our hearts, there's got to be an action, a responsibility. The truth of God, which is the word of God, will guide you in an action that brings glory to God. And that is worshipping God. That is so important. If there's not an outflow of what you've just taken in, into your head, into your heart, then there's something wrong. There's a disconnection somewhere. I want to tell you a story, and I'm sure I've told some of you the story before, but it's really pertinent to what we're talking about today. One of my favorite, all-time favorite preachers, Alistair Begg, I've spoken about him before. He's a Scottish guy, and he's got this rich uh, Scottish accent. I just love when he preaches. Um, he said that he went to a church that wasn't his own one day and um, when it sat down, it was a big church and had the big screens and, and, and um, there was a countdown clock on both screens and it's counting down, you know, four minutes and three minutes and two minutes and as it hits zero, band starts to play and guy walks onto the stage and he says, how are y'all feeling? And he was like shocked, he says, how am I feeling? He says, I got out of the bed, the wrong side of the bed, I kicked the dog. I fought with my children, got in the car, fought with somebody in traffic, was going to get into a parking at church. Somebody stole my parking. You want to know how I'm feeling? And he was quite, was quite animated about that. He says, don't ask me how I feel. Ask me what I know. How I feel changes from one moment to the next because of what happens to me. But what I know is to be the truth of God that can change my life forever. And then he quotes, the king, praise my soul, the king of heaven. He says, praise my soul, the king of heaven. To his feet, thy tribute bring. Ransom, heal, restored, forgiven. Who, like me, this praise should sing. What is it that we know as believers? Yet he's just quoted what we know as believers. Truth. We know according to the hymn, as believers, we serve the king of heaven. Who is the king of heaven? Jesus is the king of heaven. Praise my soul, the king of heaven. When we worship Jesus, we bring our tribute to Him and Him alone. Not to Mary Joseph, not to uh, the Pope, not to a pastor, not to a preacher, but to Jesus, to His feet. Why do we worship Him? Why do we worship Jesus? Why is He worthy of worship? Well, let's have a look at what He's done for us. Ransom, as the song talked about, Mark 10, 48 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and bring his life as a ransom for many. You have been ransomed from your previous way of life. If you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus has ransomed you. He's brought you back from your life of sin, from your life of, of misguidedness, for your life of destruction. Ransom healed by his stripes. We've heard it this morning already. Jesus has healed you. By Him being beaten, by Him being placed on the cross, He died in your stead. He died to give you a place in heaven. He healed you. Restored through the sacrifice that Jesus made, we are restored to a right relationship with God. 
We've been restored. Hallelujah. Before that action that happened, there was no restoration. There was always the idea of a sheep that was slain, and that pictured Jesus. But we have been restored and forgiven. Only the Messiah can forgive our sins and wash it away. And we are to sing the praise of Jesus, who has done it all. As you look at your life, and you think of worship, as Nehemiah, in Nehemiah's day, they worshipped God. How does that fit into your life? As you read scripture, if you do, I hope you do. I hope you take scripture and you open up every day. And you read what God wants to teach you for that day. What does that scripture do to you? Does it change your, your, your mind? Does it invade your mind so that your thought patterns are the thought patterns of what God wants you to think? Then secondly, as that happens, does it change your heart? As you go to work, does it change your heart? Does your heart bleed for people you know that don't know Jesus? There's got to be a heart change that happens. And then last of all, there's got to be an action. There's got to be a responsibility. We've got to act in the same way in obedience to God every day as we work together, as we serve God. It's got to be a natural thing that we don't even think about after a while. That through the reading of Scripture and through the meditation in our hearts, our actions are in line with what God wants for us. So church, here's a massive challenge for you. I want you to read uh, chapter 9 for next week. And it's to do with confession of sin. And that's the start. Where we start is about going to God every morning, every evening. And saying, Lord, I, you know just how foul my heart is. You know just how low I can be. You know what a dog I am sometimes. Would you help me as I walk this road? I come before you because you are the only one that can forgive my sins. You are the only one that can sort me out. No philosophy in life. No psychologist. No guru could ever do that. Only you can do it, Jesus. You are the King of heaven. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I want to give you thanks and praise for who you are and what you do in our lives. Lord, as we face this week, and there are going to be many challenges. Father, I pray that we face it with an understanding of Scripture. Understanding what Scripture means to us and, and, and being obedient to that Scripture. Lord God, if you ask us to pray, help us to pray. If you ask us to witness to people, give us the words to witness to people. Lord, if you want us to do something to the glory of your name, I pray that we wouldn't hesitate. We wouldn't give any justification for why we shouldn't be doing it, but we would be so steadfast in doing it. So Lord, we give this week to you and all our lives to you. And we ask that you would be close to us. Father, I also want to pray for the offering. Lord, thank you for the many gifts and talents you've given us. But it's just so beautiful to see people uh, within this body of Christ giving of their talents and, and their money to glorify your name. Would you bless this, this money as we go forward? And Lord Jesus, we want to say we love you and we, we, we want to honor you. <coughs> Help us, Lord Jesus. To be steadfast in the word. In your wonderful name we pray.